Hello, and welcome to today's special webinar event on cybersecurity lessons from the global shipping industry. Today's webinar is sponsored by Security Scorecard and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, there are a few things that you should know about this webinar. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in our webinar control panel. Not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, but we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we'll discuss in greater detail some of the top questions that you ask. Second, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. First, there's a link to the security scorecard report that this presentation is based on. And that also includes a link to get uh, your own security score, which you'll hear more about today. There are also um, links to the Guerrilla Guide Book Club and the actual Tech uh, Media Events Center, uh, where you can find out about more events like this one. So I encourage you to access those resources now and share them with your friends and your colleagues. Third, at the end of this webinar event, we will be awarding a $300 Amazon gift card to one lucky attendee on the live event. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. We recognize that some of you uh, work for organizations that don't allow you to accept prizes. And if that's the case for you, or if you want to donate the value of the gift card, we work with several great charitable organizations. Um, so if you do choose to uh, do that, we, we appreciate your uh, um, we appreciate that. The official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section. Scroll to the bottom, or you'll find the and you'll find the prize terms and conditions link there. Finally, one of the best benefits of this event is the opportunity to ask a question of our expert presenters. To help encourage your questions, we have a special additional prize for you. That's another Amazon gift card. This one for fifty dollars for the best question. At the end of the event, we'll look at all the questions, pick out the very best one, and contact the prize winner. And with that, let's get to today's fantastic content. So I'm excited now to bring on our expert presenters. We have Matthew Anselin, who's Director of Sales Engineering for Security Scorecard. And we have Cassandra Madulka, Senior Data Scientist at Security Scorecard. And they're going to be walking us through the findings of a new report uh, from Security Scorecard about security in the global shipping container industry. And we're fortunate to have Cassandra here as she was the, the lead data analyst on the report. So it's a rare opportunity to hear directly from the source of a report. The findings are fascinating. If you're in the shipping container industry or you do business with those companies, obviously the information here is going to be relevant to you. Even if you're not, global shipping is especially sensitive to geopolitical tensions, as we've all seen in recent months, you know, with issues in, in shipping affecting everyone since we're, we're all connected via a global supply chain. Beyond shipping, We'll get a view from Matthew into Security Scorecard's sophisticated overall process for gathering security information and, and developing ratings for different companies. In that sense, the shipping container industry also serves as a case study for security practices more broadly. So there's a lot of great security info in here for everyone. Uh, so it's great to have you both here. And I'm going to turn things over to Matthew to start us off. Thank you. Um, yeah, and before we get into the research, I did want to give folks on the call a little bit of background as to how we we obtain this data. Um, Security Scorecard is in the third party ratings business. So we give an A through F letter grade to uh, close to 12 million entities globally. We do that by measuring the amounts of exposures, vulnerabilities, uh, cryptological problems, various elements um, across their digital footprints. And we're, we're comparing them against other organizations of similar digital footprint size to see if they're doing better or worse than their peers in various categories to obtain those grades. But the collection mechanism that we've deployed globally to collect this data uh, is, is massive, it's extensive. And so we're touching every single IP in the entire IPv4 space in a non-intrusive fashion every day. Uh, and terabytes of data coming into our data lake, that's the source of the, uh, ultimately the source of the data that you're gonna hear analyzed and presented uh, in the rest of this presentation. So just to introduce myself again, my name is Cassandra Madolka, and I was the lead data scientist on this report comparing the shipping container industry to 
the Forbes Global 2000 companies when it comes to cybersecurity. This analysis was conducted in December of 2021. Our shipping container cohort is composed of the top 100 shipping container companies, which was taken from AlphaLiner, which is an up-to-date up source that has been referenced by other reputable companies, such as Reuters. From there, we were able to look back over the past couple of years in order to observe significant comparisons and draw out key findings. One of those key findings being that the shipping and logistics is becoming a targeted industry. <clears throat> Generally, we don't see much cyber activity in the shipping container industry in the earlier years, but lately we've seen an uptick in data breaches. In the earlier years, there are virtually little to few reported data breaches within the shipping container industry. However, in the past few years, a couple of huge breaches broke this pattern. And based on the general trend of increasing cybersecurity attacks, it's likely that this will continue to increase in the future. So on a previous analysis that's separate from this, we used machine learning techniques to look at companies at the time of breach. We found that there's a strong correlation between uh, your score and your breach likelihood. More specifically, if you have an F letter grade, you are 7.7 times more likely to be breached than if you have an A. So this is not a magic crystal ball. It does not mean that your company, if your company has an A grade, you will never get breached. And if you have an F grade, you will get breached. This is more about chances and probability. And interestingly enough, we see that this trend occurs in the shipping container industry when we look at median total scores from 2018 to present. They actually start off pretty strong with scores outperforming the Forbes Global 2000 until the past couple of years where they exhibited multiple big data breaches. And even in 2021, they continue to remain lower than in the earlier years. And since lower scores correlate with breach likelihood and hackers are definitely looking to attack that low hanging fruit, this may suggest that the shipping container industry is becoming a more targeted industry for cybersecurity attacks. Cassandra, that's that's interesting research. Um, I took a look at some of those uh, big name companies that have in fact been hit in the past four years. And I thought to, to augment the research you're providing, I might take a, a little bit of a deeper dive into some of those specific uh, cyber events. Um, one notable finding though that I found in the research um, was that unlike other industry sectors, this sector had the four largest companies in its sector suffer back-to-back -back cyber attacks. And um, that's, that's a little bit unusual. You know, you don't see that across other industries, even healthcare and financial services that are oftentimes uh, the major targets out there. Um, you, you don't see that kind of pattern. And so I thought this was interesting to present. But, uh, but yeah, let's dig into some of the specifics um, I took a look at Maersk Group first off, and uh, back in 2017, they were the victims of ransomware, specifically the NotPetya family of ransomware. This attack completely closed down their infrastructure. So if we're talking about supply chain and, and you think about uh, the last time that you had difficulty obtaining a product, obtaining raw materials, or, or even just having your, your online orders deliver uh, longer than they used to, right? Like we experience supply chain hits at the at the customer and consumer level all the time. Of course, that that trickle down effect comes from the ultimate sources of these products. And when you're talking about completely shutting down the infrastructure of one of the world's largest logistics and shipping companies, then you can expect that to have a large impact, a large impact on the availability of goods, <clears throat> the availability of raw materials. So it's it's no small thing to say that it uh, caused complete infrastructure shutdown. But let's look at how that happened and, and some of the data around that. So this particular flavor of ransomware initiates using uh, an SMB exposure. So exploiting the SMB protocol is, is not uncommon. Um, many of you may remember in the past when the NSA hit the news for having some big backdoor into uh, computer systems that was called Eternal Blue. That was an SMB based exploitation as well. WannaCry, another uh, big name malware family that uh, is still active today, uh, also leverages SMB exposures. 
and an SMB ex uh, as a protocol exposed directly to the internet, you know, is one of those things that Security Scorecard looks for on a daily basis across large swaths of companies, you know, the 12 million um, organizations that we score today and growing. Um, interestingly enough, Maersk Group today in 2022 has a score of 84. They have a B. And I looked at the analysis for their company over the past 12 months, and happily, they have no SMB exposures in the last 12 months, um, you know, not now and not in the last year, which is excellent, you know, because it's this kind of blocking and tackling, shutting down these exposures, these, these, um, these services that can be exploited or putting them behind firewalls or other protections is certainly the blocking and tackling of security that we all deal with. Um, but here's an example of what can go wrong if we miss one uh, that leads to a, you know, a critical attack like this. So I also looked at a more recent one, and this is the CMA CGM situation. Now, interestingly enough, they got hit two years in a row, uh, same month. Um, sorry for them. September 2020, also a ransomware attack, a different flavor. This is the Ragnar Locker ransomware family. So if you're not familiar, uh, Ragnar, uh, its claim to fame is that before it encrypts the data and holds that data hostage like typical ransomware, it first exfiltrates the data, uh, which is a more complex process to pull off. But by doing so, it gives them the leverage against these companies that maybe don't want to pay the ransom. There's a threat of having all of that data published to the public internet. And that's, um, that's a big deal. Now, uh, being a Chinese company, it's very difficult to get a lot of detail around this particular attack out of them. They don't have the same reporting requirements as some other countries. But we know from uh, the research we do have that uh, this particular family of ransomware, it uses a host of different methods, including the standard exploitations that you hear about, you know, server side exploits, uh, unpatched machines being exploited, but they also leverage things like social engineering and phishing email attacks. Uh, the, the classic don't click that link scenario, which then leads to exploitation, remote control, and remote uh, remote access uh, occurring, right? And and that's what gives rise to the to the droppers to be able to put these these malicious pieces of software into the systems, exfiltrate the data, accomplish the encryption task against that same data, and then um, execute the the ransom contact. So um, again, basic blocking and tackling the types of things that tools like ours look for uh, on a daily basis to ensure that these security gaps can be remediated before they're able to be used against you. Um, in 2021 here, just a few months ago, there was also a data leak incident with CMA, um, not as bad as the first one I would imagine. However, customer data was leaked, this time uh, due to a weak API or an application programming interface. So when you think about APIs, these are very, very commonly used as machine to machine conversations between companies all the time. So yet another security gap that can give rise to access um, and, uh, you know, being able to get at that data be, via the API um, just points out, you know, the necessity to have visibility into your supply chain so that you can um, uh, try to head these types of things off or uh, identify and remediate any risk before uh, incidents occur. Uh, one interesting finding that ties to this that I found in our data, when I looked at the last 12 months of history for CMA, there was, if you see the, the orange and blue lines on the graph there, there was this unusual dip in score there for a period of a few months. And what that was, was um, a higher incidence of exposed employee credentials. And what that's measuring is when employees of a company use their work email on sites that might be social, might be entertainment based, might be you know anything really, but by using your work email on non-work sites, it adds the risk to the organization. And the reason for that is if one of those sites gets breached and their user information is, is uh, compromised, then you'll have 
valid email and username combinations out in the public, which can make an attack very, very easy then back on the company that that person works for. So you're connecting your work self and your personal self out online. It's generally a bad idea because that allows attackers to leverage all of that personal data that might be easier to get about a person and link that to the work person, which can enable them to get uh, you know, a successful attack off the ground to the company they work for. So uh, we also monitor those uh, employee credential exposures. And I thought that that was an interesting find where their overall grade was fairly stable around a low B, high C in that same period. Uh, they particularly had some issues around uh, exposed employee credentials, which, you know, again, no proof of this, but certainly that could have contributed to the success of the of the ransomware attacks. Thanks, Matt, for taking us into that deeper dive into the ins and outs of the data breaches that hit the shipping container companies. I actually took it upon myself to look at specific risk factors and identify which areas are leaving these shipping container companies especially vulnerable, which brings me to our next key finding that I wanted to share with you. And that's that application security, patching cadence, and network security look to be the biggest areas for improvement. So just like a little bit of background, security scorecard categorizes its findings into 10 buckets of factors. For this analysis, the factors with notable differences are shown here in this graph. So despite the fact that the shipping container companies actually outperformed the Forbes Global 2000 when comparing median total scores, which is the fourth box here on this graph, the difference is less than two points, which isn't really practically significant. And we define practical significance here to be when the difference is large enough to be meaningful in real life. So two points isn't practically significant because that's the natural daily fluctuation we see in scoring anyways. So theoretically, this difference could change to favor Forbes Global 2000 with a flip of a switch. However, when we look at application security, patching cadence, and network security, we see a difference greater than three points. So for those of you who may not be super familiar with these terms, application security has to do with website security and web application security. Patching cadence involves patching and patching timeliness, and network security involves database exposures, protocol exposures, and cryptological problems. This three-point difference in these categories is almost half a letter grade, and this could be the difference between a company getting a B grade and an A grade. So diving a little bit deeper into patching cadence, we took a look at min critical CVEs per 1,000 IPs. So just, a, just to back up a little bit, a CVE is short for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, which is a list of publicly disclosed computer security flaws. And these CVEs are assigned a severity, either none, low, medium, high, or critical, critical being the most severe. So as you can see from this chart, shipping container companies on average have almost three times more critical CVEs, which again is the most severe type of CVEs than the Forbes Global 2000 companies. This alone leaves them especially vulnerable to a data breach. However, on the bright side and the silver lining is that CVEs can often be isolated and fixed independently from any other issue. So therefore this could honestly be a really great starting point for many shipping companies to start improving their cybersecurity. Yeah, I would agree with you there, Cassandra. Um, you know, prioritization is always a big challenge for any security operations team, not just on figuring out, you know, what CVEs they may need to prioritize ahead of others. Um, you know, is is the particular exposure out there weaponized and targeted by, by threat actors and campaigns? Um, so that's a great point. Um, I did some additional analysis actually against the the list of 100 companies. Um, I added one in there as well. So I've got uh, 101 company sample set where I, I looked for some some interesting findings um, that I could find um, in terms of how they sit today. And and the first thing that I uncovered was there is a quite wide distribution of score in that sample set, and and why that caught my attention. Many other critical infrastructure type segments of the industries like you know, financial services, healthcare, tend to have a little bit of clumping in that uh, distribution, meaning you know, the A's, B's, and C's tend to have the vast majority of the population in them. 
um, and very few D's and F's. And, and in this shipping industry sample, I noticed that there was an even spread or a much more close to even spread of companies across all five grades. Um, so what that told me is in general, it feels like there's uh, some higher percentage perhaps of C, D and F type companies in this sector. And when you look at it in the scatter plot, it kind of visually looks that way as well. Not to mention, you see some of those dots that are uh, far south on the graph. Those are ones that have had significant point decreases in um, in the last 30 days even. And so um, I, I found that to be interesting. Uh, further, I looked at specific issue types that might be in common across this um, sample set that you had put together there, Cassandra. And what I found there was also interesting. 19% um, of that sample showed various ransomware related vulnerabilities or exposures. And by that, we're talking about RDP, SMB, remote access servers, you know, and other machines that have been seen to be successful in the exploitation or uh, the the process of a, a ransomware attack in recent days. You know, and so we we correlated that across this list of 100 companies and and we're able to filter down. And that that's a fairly significant number out of that sample set uh, to say, you know, close to 20 percent there. Uh, similarly, I looked at another type of exposure and that's database exposures. And there was 20 percent of that same set also in that class where you know postgres or mysql or or uh, you know microsoft sql databases were being exposed directly to the internet um, and and so you know what are we talking about here we're talking about the basics of network security that no matter you know how big or small an organization is things can slip through the cracks. And um, you know, even as remote and of a tendril as you might have in some remote access, or so, sorry, some remote office around your global infrastructure, these kinds of exposures are the low hanging fruit that hackers look for to try to uh, attack the mothership. And so um, again, I think it's important to have the visibility into this ex uh, external exposure to share that hacker's eye view if you will, on your own organization and that of your critical vendors to be able to uh, get ahead of some of these exposures, remediate them, resolve them so that they can't uh, again be used against you. So at this point, that concludes the content that we had to share with you today. We certainly invite anyone who's listening who wants uh, to see their own scorecard to, to visit us, and we'd be happy to share that with you. Or, of course, come download the report that Cassandra put together um, so that you have the full copy of that and can see all of the, uh, the methods and analysis uh, contained within that. All right, great. Well, really interesting study and, and great discussion of the results there. So, Matthew and Cassandra, are you are you ready for some questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, sounds good. All right, great. Um, Matthew, this first one is is for you. Can you give us a little more insight into how the risk scores are calculated? Yeah, um, zero to one hundred scale. A through F grade like you're in school again uh, the grading all kind of starts at the issue level so we have over a hundred different specific issue types those are the specific specific technical findings we're looking for like expired digital certificates exposed services uh, potentially vulnerable servers the list goes on um, at at the issue level we're looking at the quantity of those issues and saying, are you doing better or worse at that issue level next to your weight class, which is to say other companies in the same statistical cohort with you that are um, similar in the, in terms of the size of their digital footprint. So it's not by employee size. It's not by industry group. Even it's it, the, the strongest correlations and, and uh, the best, the best data that we've got, is that comparison by size has the most relevance. And so are we doing better or worse? You know, how many standard deviations from mean above or below the, the group are we? 
And then that bubbles up into a factor score. There's these 10 factors, which are basically buckets of issues. And each of those gets a letter grade. And then those letter grades have a weighted average, which is applied up. And uh, that's what determines the overall grade. Okay. And let's stick with that for a second. So we have a couple of audience questions from, from Michael that are, that are kind of in, in sort of the same bucket there. Michael's wondering, do the F companies lack the most basic security characteristics? You know, what does it take to get an F? Yeah, well, there's a couple things. For one, you could be so huge and so pervasive and ubiquitous, like Microsoft, okay, can get an F because there's so much to be found. I mean, they have, I last count, I can't remember off the top of my head, I think 20 million or 200 million or some crazy sized footprint that we're monitoring. And that's all intertwined with things like consumer data and all this other. But for the vast majority, you know, the folks that aren't in that kind of outlier situation, an F grade simply translates to we're finding more stuff on you than we are on other companies of similar digital footprint size. No other implication than that. It doesn't mean that that they're uh, necessarily not trying, right? It's, but you can certainly measure behavior even over time uh, that, that is a direct reflection of the security organization. So it can absolutely, you know, a low grade, an F, uh, especially when it's like, hey, maybe the company has a B overall, but they have an F in one section. It can point to the fact that there's a, a flaw or a weakness in the whole program. There maybe patching occurs but it's not timely, right? Like the high sev patches aren't occurring fast enough to be mm -hmm. truly considered security effective. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe server side patching is going great, but there's a tendency to forget the updates at the client level, which can lead to discoveries that we can make from outside the organization of things like outdated browsers being pervasive or outdated operating systems being used at the client level. Uh, you know. That's what the F is there to do: is to to give that warning signal that that uh, you know, try as they might, the performance hasn't been as good as others of similar digital footprint size. So, you know, that's that's the end of the gotcha. statement. The rest of it is that's the leading indicator, right? That that takes you to the rest of the conversation with the actual vendor or or partner that you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, and then there was another question from Michael that, that was also sort of on this, so I figured we might as well stay with it. Um, Michael says, it's interesting your model is very dynamic based on behaviors of the companies. Um, so I, I guess that leads to a question of, you know, what is the, the updating cycle for your, your model? How, how often are you guys going out and, um, you know, hitting hitting these companies, uh, you know, to, to see... Um, you know, their, their security mm -hmm. posture, how, how often are you checking? Yeah, what's the, what's the update frequency? Yeah, so every scorecard in the entire yeah. database and of about 12 million so far and growing um, updates potentially every day. And I mean, the way that actually works on the back end is that signals are pouring into this huge data lake. They get filtered and normalized and QA'd uh, and then published in, a, in a, you know, and so, um, Every scorecard might update once a day. The bigger the company, the more likely that's going to happen. There's more things to see happen, right? Um, and then the collections occur at various cadences, depending on the issue type. So, but the short answer is every day. Every day we make new bread here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great, uh, Cassandra. This this next question is for you. In in the shipping report, um, why did you choose to look at the critical CVEs instead of all the CVEs? So as inferred by the term critical, we believe that critical are the most urgent vulnerabilities to address. Um, in addition, we also included information surrounding patching cadence. That particular risk factor also includes all CVEs and its calculation. So we believe that those two together kind of give a better overview of that risk. Okay, super. Um, Matthew, for, for those planning on doing business with a, a shipping container company, is there a way to compare the cybersecurity strength of, of different carriers? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, like we just talked about how that scoring works. Um, that creates <clears throat> what is a very usable relative scale for companies large and small. And so, um, you know, the tool has various report views and so forth that can stack rank a series of companies against each other over time, looking at various elements, whether that's grade or whether that's looking at, you know, specific elements um, of risk that, that you might want to monitor. So it's just that's a reporting function. It's absolutely something we do every day. Yep. OK. Uh, and this this next question is also probably for you. If 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 I don't do business with any shipping container companies, um, how does this affect me? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, um, you know, I, I I mentioned during the talk, all of us touch supply chain if we buy anything, and hopefully everyone on the call has an income and likes to spend it. And and as you you know you think about us as consumer level end users served by companies, companies also being customers of suppliers, um, manufacturers having, you know, that when you picture the, the globe and all of the goods and services moving around the globe to make really any mission happen, I think, you know, logistics, and I'm not talking just shipping, frankly, I'm talking trucking, Sea, sea shipments, of course, air, freight, just the moving of goods from here to there. Until we have a, a, a Star Trek style transporter that can get the job done, everything that's bought or sold has to be moved from point A to point B. And on, in almost all cases, multiple points A and points B. So I don't know how someone could not be affected by this. But at the same time, I think the theme that we heard throughout the whole talk is that the security findings that we're presenting, um, they really do apply to any industry. You know, we're not talking about threats that are only specific to the shipping industry. You know, ransomware is not just a shipping container industry problem, for instance, it's everyone's problem. And so the, the lessons we glean from Cassandra's work and, you know, really just bring us back to the same truth that cybersecurity professionals all live and breathe every day, and that is, you know, no matter what your industry, the blocking and tackling of cybersecurity has to occur or you're the low hanging fruit and, you know, breach is an inevitability. OK, hey, another audience question here, um, Matthew, and they're asking, do you have a hypothesis on why lower rated, higher risk companies have not yet been targeted? It seems major hits have been mostly on B rated. Were they lower rated at the time of the attack or the, or the higher risk companies generally lower revenue? Um, and I'd also yeah. be interested to hear oh, your, your I, hypothesis I, I, on that. Yeah, no, that I think what the, what he's referencing there is the um, the four companies that had been hit in the shipping industry here in the past four years. Um, three of the four now have B's. Um, and you know what? I did not go back and look at that's something we should have done, Cassandra, my bad. <laughs> but um, I could get back to you with what those scores look like um, back, you know, three, four years ago uh, and at the time of breach and what kinds of possible leading indicators might have popped up there. Uh, I did a little bit of that, um, just trying to do that analysis with the exposed uh, employee credential bit on the CMA. But um, I think. Um, you know, one thing that's that's true, and and again, anybody who works and lives security here and, and has to go get budget every year to try to accomplish a, a mission with a limited budget knows that after a public incident, after a major shutdown, after a huge attack occurs, it's amazing how much funding is available for cybersecurity projects. And it is very common mm -hmm. for us to see large attacks that may have had some 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 good indicators prior, you know, some some sloppy practices that we're certainly uh, tracking along for for months prior. We, we've seen a lot of that. We've seen companies take that downslide, you know, over a few period of months, and suddenly from a B now they're a C, now they're a D, and then all of a sudden they get breached. Um, we've seen that, but um, I think the real answer is it, it, a breach is a wonderful motivator to uh, senior management to 
to bolster cybersecurity. Unfortunately, it's an afterthought. You know, that's 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 what we've all dealt with over the years. But um, no wonder most of them are a B now is kind of my point. Um, because they got hit hard mm -hmm. and they got hit in the wallet and they realized that the, the millions they lost is nothing next to the hundred thousand dollar request somebody might have been making that could have fixed it or averted it. Right. Right. You know, and Cassandra, that, that leads me to a, a sort of related question. So your analysis suggests that shipping container companies have lower cybersecurity scores than the the Forbes Global 2000. However, they have a, a lower percentage of data breaches. Um, do you kind of have a theory of the case on, on that? Yeah, that's a great question. It can honestly be a bunch of different things. It could be potentially that on the whole, the shipping container companies process less personal data. So therefore, those companies are less attractive. Um, and that can account for the differences. It could also be that the Forbes Global 2000 may contain higher profile companies and shipping container companies. Um, regardless, either way, it's still important for shipping container companies to make sure their cybersecurity is strong in case of a potential data breach. Um, and to, this analysis also only looks at the number of data breaches and not necessarily the magnitude or the severity of the data breach. So we also need to keep that in mind. Okay, gotcha. Um, Matthew, this next one's sort of a, a technical question, I think, about the, the product. So I'll point this one to you. Um, from the audience, where do you get information for the CVEs and does it update automatically and how often does that update? I uh, the CVE specifically, and, you know, uh, yeah, you want to take it, but I, I was going to say, first off, CVEs are just but one issue type, just to be clear, you know, there's almost a hundred of them. Um, CVEs represent one little factor group in terms of patching, patching cadence. But yeah, Cassandra, do you want to you want to take that one? Yeah, just to expand on that. So CVEs are a list of publicly disclosed security flaws. And so if you want more information about like which, like a, like the more specifics, you can go to cve.org and that you can look up certain CVEs and get more information surrounding those. And for our database, we get, um, it updates daily for us. Yeah. And, and what it really comes down to is not all CVEs are detectable by public means. So that's another filter over what you might see on a public CVE list, like CVE details or the NIST site or something. Um, you know, not every, not every vulnerability can be detected by non-intrusive public signals. So we take the ones that we can detect and we respond very quickly, in fact, to new ones like the big log4j that splashed in the news here and everybody had to scramble around and deal with. That's not the kind of vulnerability that you would think is detectable externally because that's an you know internal log version number inside of some server that you know you would think you can't get that non-intrusively. In fact, um, we did find a way to get that non-intrusively just from um, simple like a kind of a web crawling that analyzes HTTP metadata response. How about that? You know, we've got a talented group, but um, but it's like in the short answer is we surface what we can. We cannot necessarily uh, surface data on every CVE because some are so internal to the organization that we have no way of detecting them externally. OK, gotcha. Great. Um, this next question comes from Harvey. He's asking, how are suppliers managing the use of shadow IT in their organization? Can they ensure data won't be transferred over insecure channels? You want me to take that one, Cassandra? Uh, yeah, go for it. Because that's, that's actually a two-part question I heard there. Um, and can you repeat the question, Scott? The first yeah, part. yeah, you bet. How are suppliers managing? Yeah, how are suppliers managing the use of shadow IT in their organization? So let's let's do that one first. Okay, let's stop stop that one. Yeah, that's like one question. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways yeah. internally to do that, and so there's lots of specific tools. But one way people use our product to do that. You know, I mentioned that we uh, were, were cataloging these 12 million companies. Well, the first thing that has to happen before a, a scorecard can be born 
is we have to map out the digital footprint and then that digital footprint has to be continuously updated. So that's why we touch every IP every day, all that. Um, so we have a capability where you can flag your IPs and domains. For instance, if you're looking at your own scorecard, right? This is a, a self-monitoring use case, mm -hmm. even though the tool is ostensibly, you know, very much a third-party monitoring tool. Um, but folks, certainly second most popular use case is to look at yourself. And it can be very interesting, uh, especially when you analyze your digital footprint from a perspective of what is security scorecard tagging as mine that I may or may not feel like is mine, right? Or may not have on my spreadsheet of IPs that I routinely pen test, for instance. So determining the delta between our findings and your findings can be very, very illuminating. And um, in multiple cases, you know, sometimes we find a little more innocuous things, you know, like um, some marketing server from two years ago that uh, isn't connected to the WAN and, you know, really just kind of a brochureware site, but it's still up there, even though you, somebody told you that it would, was taken down, it's still sitting out there. It might have some kind of information. It's kind of an island, right? So it might be easy to attack because nobody's been patching it or looking at it. They don't even remember it's there. So sometimes it's like that. But then other times, like in the in the case where we had a, a, a company that supported the defense industry and we were on a call and um, we pulled up their digital footprint and I said, well, that's interesting. We're spotting two IPs in China and one in Vietnam. Just kind of let that one hang in the air. I heard a little shuffling and, oh, that can't be right. That can, that that's uh, yeah, that's got to be false positive. It didn't take but an hour after the call. I got a call back. And they said that wasn't a false positive. Turns out we put a, a, a contract out for bid. Somebody won it. That person subcontracted it. They subcontracted it. Long story short, we've got data sitting in China and Vietnam. Thank you. And by the way, yeah, there's a PO on the way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was like one of those. So, you know, shadow IT, right. the, the notion is you examine the IPs you're aware of. And if we're tracking and looking for any signs you know, we, we didn't ask you what your IPs and domains are. We're discovering that. So once you've tagged your known IT footprint from our side, then if you wake up one morning and you see a couple new domains that weren't tagged, that's your first indicator. You might want to investigate that. That That's one way people use to ferret out shadow IT using our tool. Gotcha. Yeah, and then the second part of the question, I don't know if it's, um, you know, if it directly applies to, to what you guys do, but maybe it does. Uh, it was, can can organizations, suppliers ensure data won't be transferred over insecure channels? Well, that's a tough one for sure, because we're not actually tagging and tracking data. We're not like a DLP company, you know, but um, if you think about the mechanisms mm -hmm. that are used to... Uh, perform that transport. So what could it be? It could be HTTP, but more commonly, SSH, FTP, you know, uh, API usage, like, you know, the, today, it's like, what's an insecure channel? And, and is it legitimate traffic to and from a legitimate partner or not? You know, those are questions for your firewall admin, really, because because that's, that's how that's supposed to be managed. But from the outside, we can certainly tell if, in general, we're seeing um, bad cryptological practice, you know, uh, running expired certs, uh, running non third party validated certs for, for any important mission that can be dangerous, you know, or it's certainly consumer facing stuff too, you know, so, so we're looking at the, the security habits um, as an indicator so that someone who's concerned that a third party might not be good stewards of their data, then they, they have some specific areas they can ask questions. It's not just a general question. Hey, is my data safe with you? Yes, it is. And can you send that next million bucks, please? Okay, thank you. Right. Instead, it's a more meaningful mm -hmm. conversation that might have, you know, more teeth to it, if you will. Like you said, you're good to go with all of, all of our data, but you know, we're seeing a lot of bad practices around cryptological certificates and, and aren't those the basis for 
secure internet data transmit. I mean, TLS is pretty pervasive, right? You know, and then you ask the questions and that's, that's what it's meant to mm -hmm. do. It's meant to, to be a, a, a guide, a leading indicator, like something that's a, that's a directional guidance that says, you might want to look over here. Here's a little smoke. Go see if it's actually on fire. Okay, great. Um, Cassandra, this next one is, is for you. W what area of risk should ship and container companies be most concerned about based on uh, your findings? Um, yeah, so based on the report, in my opinion, I think between the number of critical CVEs, which again, if you remember the chart, it was three times, almost three times more for the shipping container companies than um, the Forbes Global 2000 companies. And that coupled with the low patching cadence score, I believe that patching cadence would be the first area to begin with, and more specifically those CVEs, especially since those can be isolated and solved independently of other issues. So I personally think that would be um, one of the best ways to start off with and probably one of the more concerning parts. Okay, patching cadence. Good advice um, and good advice for everybody. Uh, you know, Matthew, you know, as you look at this data, what are some of the broader lessons of security that go beyond shipping that maybe this, this report reinforced, but, you know, apply to almost any organization? Yeah, just I hate to keep using the phrase blocking and tackling, but that the, just the, the mm. general best practices of any security program, patch your servers, update your client applications, keep your crypto up to date, keep your crypto valid. Don't use deprecated crypto that they can be easily brute forced. Um, don't expose databases directly to the Internet. Do it like all the the, the best in the best do, which is, you know, web stacks where the database is thoroughly buried and hidden from the light of day, right? I mean, uh, all of the the core security principles that that um, that you hear from any webinar, it's it's really that because it doesn't always take some high level of sophistication to damage a company's reputation and cost them potentially millions it's, it's almost always the easy things. And then don't forget that last very, very important part, the human element, your training programs matter. You know, your, your, um, your attention to bringing consciousness to cybersecurity, to your employee base at all levels matters. Uh, and, and again, that's, you know, I think that's all just best practice stuff right there. It's so very generic advice, if you will. Um, we're just, uh, you know, using a little bit of, uh, I don't know, maybe you call it uh, faming and shaming to to make sure folks can <laughs> readily share and understand that information in an easy way. Like everybody knows if you're an F, that's not a good thing. It's like, you know, you don't have to be a cybersecurity professional to not like that. Well, good. Let's do something about it. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You know, the generic advice that headlines are filled every year uh, or every week, even with, with people who miss the generic advice and, you know, now they have a breach or uh, some sort of major security problem. Right. Um, you know, we have a, we have a question from Bradford, which sounds like a, a basic value proposition of, of your product, but he, he's saying before or during an acquisition or business partnership, is it possible to obtain a report from security scorecard initiated by either side. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll well, uh, let me put that question to you first and then, I, and then I've got a follow up for you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, heavy M&A companies not only like to do the pre due diligence work there because we can set up private little teams within the platform and they can just, you pick a name of a company, you drop it in there, you instantly see their scorecard. Uh, very, very easy. Again, you can run the comparisons. And why do you do that? You do that. So if you've got an, uh, an attractive acquisition target, but they've got a low score, it lets you dig deeper in specific areas to find out if you're going to have a little bit of extra financial burden once you acquire them to bring them up to your standards. 
that's really what it's about in the M and A space. Perfect. And, uh, and so, you know, along those lines, how, do, how does licensing of security scorecard work as far as, you know, being able to check your own score and then checking on the scores of, you know, partners, suppliers, or potential vendors? Oh, yeah. So shameless, shameless company plug. You got it. Uh, here it comes. <laughs> um, so <laughs> everyone on this call, I want you to know that um, you can look at your own scorecard for free. Just come to our website, securityscorecard.com, uh, download the document. I think Cassandra's uh, report may have links in there as well. Uh, just reach out to us, right? We'll set up your free access. You'll you'll be able to have access to your own scorecard permanently, unredacted, for, at no cost. Um, you pay us when you want to look at someone other than yourself. And back to your previous question, let's say this is post-acquisition time. Let's say you guys happen to buy and sell companies all day, every day, right? That's the kind of business you are. Um, you might want to be able to monitor that migration of assets as they come in and out of your, of your uh, enterprise. You might want to be able to independently monitor a bunch of brands or a bunch of subsidiaries or divisions or acquisitions that are operating as wholly owned subsidiaries. And, you know, and we can do that. Um, but that's, more than just looking at yourself um, as as how it defines. And so that's, again, when you would purchase some number of, of slots, we call them, that would be a, um, uh, you know, that's that's what you pay for with us. The more companies outside of yourself that you want to monitor and examine, um, the, the higher the uh, subscription cost is. The lower the unit cost, of course, but you know what I mean? That's that's how it's licensed. Yep. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, well, I think that's about about all the questions we have time for. Um, Cassandra, great report. Appreciate the uh, the summary and, and all the insights about it. And, and Matthew, thanks for all the insights about uh, about the product and, and about uh, about the industry generally. Appreciate both you guys being on. You bet. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, so just as a reminder, as as Matthew was, was saying there, uh, Cassandra's report is available in your handout section. This is almost your last chance to grab it here uh, today, so be sure to, to do that. It's the top link there, Proactive Security Measures for Global Maritime Shipping. Uh, and as Matthew mentioned, it does have the link in it where you can go to the Security Scorecard uh, site to uh, to check on, on your own companies or your own organizations uh, scorecard. Um, and before we do wrap up, we have one more piece of business. It's the $300 Amazon gift card prize drawing. And the winner of that $300 Amazon gift card is Mark Botticello from Pennsylvania. So congratulations to Mark. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I do want to again, thank Matthew and Cassandra. And uh, I'd also like to thank Security Scorecard for making this event possible. And last but not least, I'd really like to thank everybody for attending and for all of the great questions uh, that you that you entered in there, you know, throughout the session. That concludes today's event. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>